Hello everyone and welcome back to another lecture video. In this video we're going to be talking about P-delta effects in steel frames. Now before I begin I just want to say that I hope you all are doing well and having fun in structural engineering. Now I'm also going to be honest with you guys. <laughs> Today's topic is a topic not a lot of students seem to enjoy. And this is because unlike other design topics where you are provided the loads and asked to select a member or verify the adequacy of a member, this topic is more on the structural analysis side of things. So that's when all the unpleasant nightmares of your old structural analysis class come back into play. The nice thing though is that at this stage when we're designing, we typically use software to do the analysis so it's not going to be too bad. And if you're still struggling to understand the concepts that I present today, do not worry as I will have multiple examples of the theory applied to actual design scenarios in the description down below. Alrighty, so with that being said, let's jump into the theory. So we're going to start with the idea of steel frames. Now at this point in the design class, we've always talked about members by themselves. We talked about a beam isolated by itself. We talked about a column isolated by itself. But we know that in reality, beams, columns, they're all joined together to form what we would call a steel frame. So as we know, we can take a bunch of these beams, columns, join them together, and the result would be a steel frame that is capable of withstanding a combination of vertical and horizontal loads. So if I were to combine a bunch of columns and beams, I would get something similar to what we have on the screen. Now it's very important to start discussing how do we join these members together? The most common type of connection is what we call a shear connection. And these connections transfer both axial load as well as shear. The key thing to keep in mind is that these do not transfer moment. It's basically one of those connections that you could almost picture where it's just gonna be a bunch of steel bolts. Now, when we actually show these connections on paper, we usually label them as hinges. In reality, they would prevent some moment, but to be conservative, we would say that these type of connections do not resist any sort of moment. Now, this is important when we start talking about how loads are going to be transferred down to the foundation. If I were to apply a gravity load to this frame of W, well, we know that the load will be picked up by the beams, transferred to the columns via these shear connections, and then the columns would then transfer the load down to the foundation. So when it comes to vertical loads, as we can see, this is not too bad. The problems start to arise, however, when we have lateral loads. So if I were to have a lateral load on my frame right here, we actually have a problem because if these shear connections do not transfer any moment, well, then our frame is actually just going to topple over. It's almost like, a, like an unstable truss structure. So when we look at this, we need to actually find a way to provide some lateral resistance. Now, one of the most simplistic ways is actually looking at these connections and saying, you know what, if these connections can transfer a moment, well, then my frame has the capabilities of resisting this lateral load. So if we look on our frame at the very left, if I were to take those two shear connections, pull them away and replace them with moment connections, and then reapply the lateral load, well, our frame would actually be able to resist this lateral load. Now, the key thing to keep in mind here is that I would only place the moment connections at very specific points. And the reason why, well, it's expensive. <laughs> you guys know by now that in structural design, one of the biggest aspects at play besides, of course, safety is money. You want the most economical design and these moment connections, oh, they're very expensive. It's not easy to transfer moment. So what we would typically do is we would only select one bay to be our moment resisting frame. And those other bays would actually not resist any lateral load, but rather lean on the moment resisting frame. So as we can see, the two columns on the very right hand side, we would actually call these leaning columns. As we can see, there's no moment on them. They just kind of topple over and then use the moment resisting frame to provide that lateral support. Now, moment resisting frames are only one of the many solutions to resisting these lateral loads. As we're going to talk about, there's a bunch of different types of what we call lateral load resisting frames. The one we just talked about is what we would call a moment resisting frame. So we have a nice picture here. And again, when I'm designing these moment resisting frames, typically I would only pick one or two bays to actually have these moment connections because they're pretty expensive. So if we look at this moment resisting frame, it's important to note that we have moment connections, meaning that we have to have a moment transfer at these connections. Now to do this, we typically use welds, stuff like that. So as you will know, it's going to get pretty expensive. But this is actually very nice because if we look at this scenario right here, we have two wide open bays. What does that mean for us? Well, it means if we wanna put a door here, no problem. If we wanna put a window here, no problem. 
But as I mentioned, these are pretty expensive. So if you've been out in the world and have seen steel frames before, chances are you're more accustomed to what we call concentrically braced frames. So if we look here, we go back to all those shear connections, which are basically pinned connections. But rather than fixing one of the connections, what we do is we actually apply braces in the bays. So the most common example, of course, would be a cross brace. So if I look at my frame here, the bay on the left, I can add cross bracing. Now when I apply a lateral load, the load is going to travel down through the brace to the foundation, which is what we want. Another type of bracing that we could have is what we call V-bracing, so it's going to look something like this. And this is great, because since we're connecting the braces via pin connections, we actually have no shear or moment in our actual braces. These will essentially act as compression or tension members, which is great because we've covered compression and tension members and we know that the design of them is actually pretty simplistic. Now I'm going to be honest with you, it does get a little bit more complex when we talk about seismic design because we would actually allow these members to start yielding, either in tension or buckling in compression. So this is nice because if we were to compare this system to a moment resisting frame, the stiffness of our system actually increased a lot. If we were to look at a moment resisting frame, under lateral loads it's fairly common to get something like 50 millimeters of deflection. If we were to look at these concentrically braced frames, our deflection goes down a lot to something maybe like one millimeter. The other nice thing too is these concentrically braced frames are typically cheaper than moment resisting frames, so they do become a more economical solution. The problem, however, as we can see, is that these braces take up the entire bay. So we can't really put a window in, we can't really put a door in, anything like that. Now, the best of both worlds when it comes to moment resisting frames and concentrically braced frames are something that we call eccentrically braced frames or EBFs. Now these are very nice, but they can kind of suck to design. Eccentrically braced frames have the ductility of moment resisting frames, but also the stiffness of concentrically braced frames. And you're looking at this saying, well, all right, Clayton, how does it achieve that? Well, it's very similar to concentrically braced frames where we're going to put a brace into our system, but notice that there is a small distance or eccentricity between the end location of our brace and the column. Now, what we would do at this location is we would actually put what we would call a beam link, and we would rely upon this beam length to undergo significant yielding, thus increasing the ductility of our system. The problem, however, is that if we were to look on the right side of that beam link, it actually has to be fixed to the column. So we actually require somewhat of a moment connection in these type of frames in addition to adding braces. This is where the benefits of both of the previous systems come into play. Now this is what we would call an unsymmetrical brace. However, you guys are probably more familiar with a symmetrical brace, which would look something like this. It's also nice because if we were to look at this system, particularly the symmetric EBF, as we can see, we now have room for a door. So again, it's kind of the best of both the MRF as well as a CBF. But again, these are very expensive to fabricate because it requires moment connections as well as braces. So it's something that we don't typically use in non-seismic related purposes. However, the whole goal of this lecture isn't actually braced frames. That's something we're going to talk about a little bit down the road. The goal of today's lecture is to talk about moment resisting frames and more specifically what phenomenons happen when they encounter these lateral loads. As we are going to see, since these moment resisting frames do not have very good stiffness, meaning they deform laterally quite easily, they are very prone to something called second order effects. Now if we look at the title here, it's kind of interesting because we have two different types. We have P-delta and P-delta. <laughs> so it's very confusing right off the bat because they're both labeled P-delta. So what you'll typically hear people say is P-small delta as well as P-big delta. Now this effect occurs in axially loaded members as they deform. And the reason why is this. If something is under axial load, well typically that axial load acts directly through the member. However, as that member starts to deform, bend, whatever you want to call it, well, this axial load then starts to act at an eccentricity, creating additional moments and axial forces. And again, this is known as second order effects, and we categorize them into either P big delta or P small delta. Now, when I mention these two types, it's not very clear right off the bat what they are. So let's take a look at these two cases. The first one that we have is what we call P small delta effects. 
And this is when the axial load amplifies the loads due to deformation between the ends of a member. So that's going to be the key here. The deformation is occurring between the ends of the member. So if I were to have a simply supported beam like this, think of it more as a wall, well, we know it's going to have an axial load and we can subject it to something like a wind load. Now, when you guys look at this, you guys are going to say, oh, Clayton, well, it's pretty simple. If we have a wind load, we know that there is going to be a deflection profile as such. Now, where the P small delta comes in is when we look at this deflection profile, we say that it deformed by a distance small delta. Now, this is important because if I were to start looking at the internal forces in the section, so I were to snip it in half, something like this, and I were to place the cut with the internal forces, well, we can now see that this normal force, which would be equivalent to the axial load if we're neglecting self-weight, well, this would actually create a moment around A. Again, if we were to look at the picture on the left, that axial load is concentric, meaning it goes straight down the beam right into A. However, if we were to consider the situation on the right after it deformed, well, this axial load now acts at a distance of small delta from A, thus it's actually going to create additional moments. Now, for these P small delta effects, we actually consider them in beam column design. So we're not going to actually talk about them too much in this lecture. That'll be the concept of next lecture. Today's lecture is something a little bit more simple, and that is P big delta effects. Now, it's going to be the same situation on the left, but instead of looking at the deformation between the ends of the member, we are going to look at a scenario where one of the member's ends displaces relative to the other. Now you're saying, all right, Clayton, that's a lot of word garbage. What does that mean? Well, let's look at this cantilever beam as such. If I wanted to, I could take the moment about A right off the bat, and I would find that it's equal to WL squared divided by 2. So again, nothing too crazy, nothing too groundbreaking. However, if I were to look at this and say, you know what, that lateral load is going to deform my beam. We know it's going to deflect as such. But the key thing here is that axial load has to go with it. So that axial load now moves from the left all the way over to the right side. And if I were to now take the moments about A considering these P delta effects, well, it's going to be WL squared over 2 yet again. However, we now have to add that moment created by the axial load. So we have to add P plus delta. So as we can see, this is going to start getting a little bit tricky. And the reason why is this. If we were to look at the moment about A, it's reliant upon the deflection. I need to know what delta is. However, delta is reliant on the moment. So as we can see, we kind of get a cyclic thing where we have to calculate delta, then calculate the moment, and then recalculate delta, then recalculate the moment. And as we will see, it converges upon a solution, which is great. However, it can be a little bit tricky. Now, again, the reason why students don't like this topic is because this effect right here, P big delta, well, this is considered in the actual analysis of these steel frames. Now, there's two different perspectives that we can look at. The first is from purely a structural analysis standpoint, we can calculate these P-delta effects. It's not very nice. Usually you need some iterations. However, the good news for you is that the Canadian code for steel design says, you know what? Structural analysis kind of sucks. Of course, it doesn't actually say that, but I know most of you are thinking that. So the code says, if you want, we can have a simplified method to calculate these second order effects that doesn't require a lot of iterative structural analysis. So you're thinking, you know what, Clayton, that sounds pretty good. What is this method? Well, in order to actually look at this method, we need to discuss a couple of things first. And the first one is this. When you analyze a frame, a steel frame specifically, in CSA S16, CSA specifically says in clause 841 that the following stability requirements always have to be considered. No matter what you're doing, these have to be considered. The first one is that all deformations contributing to structural displacements have to be considered. Well, this is something that you've actually done before. It's not very clear because the wording is a little bit confusing, but basically it's saying if you have a structure like we do at the bottom left and it's subjected to some loads, so in this case we have a gravity and lateral load, well, you have to calculate displacements. So you're thinking, you know what? I already know that. Of course, if I have some loads on my structure, I probably have to calculate the displacements at some point. So requirement A, not too bad. The second requirement, and this is where it gets a little bit hairy, is that all geometric nonlinearity, so that is both P small delta and P big delta, it has to be considered. 
So this is the main topic of today is how do we consider this geometric nonlinearity? Specifically P big delta effects because again P small delta effects are actually considered in the actual design, not in the frame analysis. Now if we're looking at this, and if you're wondering, hey Clayton, what exactly are these effects again? Well remember, if we have a structure that deforms as follows, well, we know that between the end members, it's going to deflect by a distance delta, and we have to consider the amplified moments from that. And we know that the end members are also going to translate by a distance big delta, and we have to consider that as well. Now, there's actually three more requirements that we have to consider. The first one is geometric imperfections. So some examples of this would be some initial structural displacements, out of plumbness, all those fun things. Now you're saying, all right, Clayton, what is that exactly? Well, let's look at a structure when it's first being fabricated, okay? So this is before any occupants are in it, anything like that. So there's no actual loads on our structure. Well, when we design something, we design things to be <laughs> quote unquote perfect. If I'm looking at my column from the blueprints, it's going to be perfectly vertical. However, when you're actually erecting that column in real life, will it be perfectly vertical? Well, maybe not. It might have a slight initial displacement. That's something that we have to account for. Now, you don't have to be too worried because what happens in these design codes is there's actually a tolerance. All right, there's a tolerance. It says there can be a small initial displacement. However, it has to be within a certain limit. So if you're worried about the structural displacement being quite large, well, don't worry. Again, it has to fall under a tolerance. Another one, too, that we have to consider is that beams can have initial cambers. One of the big things, again, in Canada is going to be weather. So if we have one side that's really cold and the other side that's really warm, well, this will actually give a slight camber to our beam. So again, it's not going to be perfect when it's actually erected. And that's something we have to account for when analyzing these frames. Other things that we have to account for is the stiffness reduction due to partial yielding. Chances are at some part in, in our beam, there may be stress concentration, stuff like that and part of the member might actually yield. This is something we have to take into account. And the last one is uncertainty in strength and stiffness, both on a global and local level. So a global level would be the structure as a whole. The local level would be a specific beam, a specific column, something like that. Now, if you're looking at requirements C through E and saying, Clayton, that looks really tough. Like the geometric nonlinearity in B, that was hard enough. How am I supposed to account for basically uncertainty? Well, as we are going to see, this portion right here is all going to come into effect with something called the notional load, and it's actually rather simple. So that's not going to be too bad. So if we were to take a step back and look at this, requirement A, well, that's something that we've always done before. That's no big deal. Part B, geometric nonlinearity, that's something that is new, but we're going to talk about right now. And then part C through E is something we're also going to talk about now, but again, it's really simple. Now, when you look at these actual requirements in CSA, CSA can be a little bit vague where it says any rational method used to satisfy these requirements is valid. That's given in clause 8.4.2. However, CSA is smart. It's looking at those requirements and saying, those are pretty hard requirements to satisfy. So what CSA does is it gives us a simplified stability analysis method in clause 8.4.3. And it basically says, provided that the following three things are true, you can use this method. The first one is that the structure is designed using an elastic analysis. Well, of course, we are going to do that anyway. That's easy street. So that one's always <laughs> generally satisfied. So what does that mean? Well, if I were to look at my frame right here and I had the following loads, when I'm designing my structure under these loads, I'm not going to include the effects of yielding. I'm just going to keep everything elastic. But again, if you think about it, that's a good thing. Once we start getting into yielding, the analysis becomes quite tough. So keeping it elastic, well, that's actually a very nice, generous thing from CSA. The second requirement, again, very easy, is that the gravity loads are supported by vertical elements or columns. It's basically saying that the gravity loads have to be supported by vertical columns. Only in very rare cases are you going to have these gravity loads not supported by vertical columns. So for the most part, part B is always satisfied. The last one that many students always forget to check, <laughs> including myself at times, is that the factored axial load in our moment resisting frame columns, so I labeled it in green here because we're only talking about the moment resisting frame columns, it cannot exceed 0.5 CY, where CY is the axial force to create yielding, not including any buckling or anything like that. 
So we know that CY is just going to be the area of the cross section multiplied by FY. So if I had this scenario down below, I would look at those two green columns because they are my moment resisting frame columns, and I would have to verify that my axial force in both of them is less than half of the yield force. So it's not too hard. So we can take a step back and saying, well, you know what, Clayton, those requirements are very easy to do. So if I meet the requirements, I can do this analysis method. But what exactly is this analysis method? Well, the simplified stability analysis method involves an elastic analysis in which two things have to be considered. The first one is P delta effects. And as we are going to see in clause 8432, CSA gives us two different options to consider these P delta effects. This would meet condition B of our stability requirements. The second one, which is the easiest one of all, is that notional loads specified in clause 8433 are added to all load combinations. So I've already talked about it a little bit, but these notional loads basically account for all the uncertainty in our structure, as well as things like partial yielding. So this would satisfy the requirements of C, D, and E in our stability requirements. So if we look here and we consider these two things, what we are actually essentially doing is satisfying all of those stability requirements listed in CSA. So if we look at this and we say, okay, if I know the P delta effects, as well as the notional loads, well, then I'm good to go. So let's discuss what they are. The first one is going to be notional loads. Again, the big thing with these notional loads is they account for the uncertainty related in our structure. Now, how do we do this? Well, basically all we are going to do is calculate an additional lateral load, which is called the notional load, and apply it to every story of our structure. Now, the value of the notional load or the magnitude is given in clause 8433, and it's actually taken as 0.5% of the total factor gravity load of that story. So if I were to describe the notional load in a formula, it'd be the following, where NL is equal to 0.005 multiplied by that gravity load PFG. Now, something I have to clarify really quick, this is not any official symbols. If you look at clause 8433, it's all words. It's, it's not an equation or anything like this. So describing the notional load as NL, that's just something I do. This isn't, again, an actual thing from CSA. It's just what I like to do to kind of remember the formula, if you will. Now, if we were to look at the calculations, it's actually pretty simple. If I were to have the following frame, which is subjected to a distributed load of 25 kilonewtons per meter and a lateral load of 50 kilonewtons, all I'm basically going to do is figure out the total gravity load placed on this frame and then add 0.5% of that to the lateral load. You're saying, Clayton, what exactly does this mean? Well, let's look at the calculation. If I want the factor gravity load for the story, I'm going to take that 25 kilonewtons per meter, multiply it by the length, 20 meters, and I find that the factored gravity load is 500 kilonewtons. Next, I'm going to take 0.5% of that, so 0.005, multiplied by that 500 kilonewtons, and I get that my notional load for this story is 2.5 kilonewtons. I'm then going to take that 2.5 kilonewtons and I'm going to add it to my existing lateral load, which was the 50 kilonewtons. So when I'm actually doing the structural analysis for this structure, my lateral load would actually be 52.5 kilonewtons and not 50. Again, this 2.5 kilonewtons, this is going to account for all of the uncertainty in my structure as well as things like partial yielding. And because we're dealing with uncertainty, it's very important that we apply this notional load in the most detrimental direction. You'd be pretty trolly to apply it in the opposite direction of the lateral loads, therefore decreasing your lateral loads. Remember, when we're dealing with uncertainty, we want to be conservative. If I were to take that 50 kilonewtons and subtract 2.5, well then again, you're kind of just being a troll. We don't really do that in structural design. We always want to take the most conservative case. It should be noted that as the gravity load of each story might be different, the notional load needs to be calculated on a per story basis. We will see this when we do the multi-story example. So that's gonna be notional loads. But again, remember, that was one out of the two things we have to do. The second thing we have to do, which is the big one, if you will, is accounting for those P delta effects that we talked about before. Now CSA actually has a very specific clause for these P delta effects in 8432, and it says you have two different options to account for these P delta effects. The first one is conduct what we call a second order analysis. So this would be something like SAP, S-frame, etc., 
where you input all of the loads on your structure and you actually tell the software to conduct the second order analysis so that the software will actually include all of these P delta effects. Now this is very nice if you know how to use the software. However, most civil engineering students or structural engineering students, when they're just coming out of university, don't know these types of software. What they do know, however, is how to do a first order analysis. So basically, simple structural analysis. Now, CSA knows this and says, well, you know what? If you know how to do first order analysis, well, what you can do is actually take your existing axial loads and bending moments from your first order analysis and amplify them by a U2 factor where this U2 factor is basically the second order effects because it'll amplify our existing bending moments and axial load accordingly. The key thing here though, is that when we're determining this U2 factor from our first order analysis, that analysis has to consider three things, translational loads, notional loads, as well as structural translation. We're gonna talk about that structural translation a little bit later because as we're going to see, that's gonna be the most tricky of those three loading. So in the end, we basically get two equations, one for moment and one for axial load. If we were to look at these equations, they seem rather simple because each one only contains three parameters and the parameters themselves are also simple. If we were to look at MF and PF, which is what we're solving for in both of those equations, these are going to be our design moments and axial loads. So if I was designing a beam column, the loads would actually come from this equation right here. If we were to look at this equation, the first term, MFG and PFG, well, this is the moment in axial load due to our gravity load analysis. Or it's basically a first order analysis where we only have gravity loads applied to our system. If we were to look at the ends of both equations, we have an MFT and a PFT. This is going to be the moment in axial load due to a first order analysis where we then apply only translational loads. Now the big thing in these equations that's prevalent in both is they both have this U2 factor, which is basically just an amplification factor that accounts for those P delta effects. So it's going to be the big thing that we're going to have to calculate, but in the end, it's not too bad. If we were to look at one of these equations by themselves, as we can see, all we're doing is taking the moments from our gravity load analysis, and we're adding them to an amplified moment from a translational analysis. So all in all, we are actually going to have to do two first order analysis, one for gravity loads and one for lateral loads. Now, the key thing to keep in mind when you're figuring out which option you wanna do, either a second order analysis or the first order analysis with the U2 amplification, no matter which one you pick, you have to include the notional loads in both of them. One of the most common mistakes I've seen is if students opt to do a second order analysis directly in the software, they do not add notional loads. They think notional loads are related to second order effects. Again, they're not. Notional loads are more on the uncertainty side of things, so always keep that in mind. If you wanna do a second order analysis and skip all of this amplification factors, it's perfectly valid, but in your second order analysis, you still have to include those notional loads. Now, if you're looking at this and saying, okay, well, if I opt to do the first order analysis, because that is what I was taught in undergrad, it seems pretty simple. All I need is moments and axial loads, which I know how to do from structural analysis, but I also need to figure out what exactly is that U2 factor. Well, it's nice because in clause 8432, there's actually two equations used to calculate this U2 factor. U2 by itself is simply going to be one divided by one minus PSF divided by PSE, and if we look here, they give us a second equation for PSE, where it's this big, long, gross equation. Now, if we were to look at this, it has several different parameters. But as we are going to see, most of the parameters are actually fairly trivial, and we can obtain them just by looking at the geometry of our frame. The first one, this PSF, which appears in both of the equations, is the total factored vertical load supported by the story. So that's it. You're just going to find that total vertical load supported by the story. That's your PSF. Note that if we're dealing with multi-story scenarios, the bottom stories will also carry the load of the stories above. This means that if we had a two-story frame and we are calculating PSF for the first story, we would need to actually include the load from the second story in the calculations. But that's it for PSF. Nice and simple. 
The second one, VSF, is the total factored story shear. So this is going to be dependent on the lateral loads placed on a structure. And we're going to talk about these in a little bit. HS, that's going to be story height. So if my story was six and a half meters tall, HS would simply be six and a half meters. So again, a lot of these just come from looking at the geometry. Where it starts to get a little bit tricky is this delta F parameter. If you ever see a delta, you know that this is related to deflection. And in this case, delta F is the first order relative story deflection. We're going to talk a little bit more what this relative means in one of our examples. For instance, if I were to have a two-story frame structure and I were to look at the deflection of the second story, well, I'm actually going to compare the deflection of the second story to the first story. I'm not comparing it to the actual base of the structure. I'm only going to compare it on a per story basis. Now, PSFMF is very similar to PSF, but instead of the total factored vertical load carried by the entire story, this is going to be the total factored vertical load carried by the moment resisting frame columns. And this can be found using the principles of tributary area. So again, not too bad. So if we were to take a look at all five of these parameters that we need, there's only two real tricky ones. Again, PSF, HS, and PSF, MF can all be obtained just by looking at the geometry of the story. However, these two are actually going to come from our first order analysis, which is again why students typically hate this topic because no one wants to do a first order analysis. Now, before we actually talk about how this is conducted, we have to note two different things or two special cases given in CSA. The first one is that PSF MF may be taken as zero for braced frames. Now you may be saying, all right, Clayton, how do I know if this is braced or not? Well, this is actually classified in clause 1381. Now this clause states that the frame is classified as braced if the deflection of the frame without its braces is greater than five times the deflection of the frame with its braces. Now that may seem like a very stringent requirement, but as you will see, if you add even one brace to your frame, chances are it's going to be a braced frame. Adding those braces significantly increases the stiffness of the system, thus resulting in much smaller deflections. The second one that I want to mention, and this is going to be something we talk about a little bit later, is that if we're dealing with seismic design, which is given in section 27 of CSA, the calculation for U2 is actually going to be a little bit different. It starts to rely a little bit on the ductility of the system rather than just simple structural analysis, which makes sense because in seismic design, we start to focus a lot on the ductility of the system to make sure that it can handle the energy requirements of the earthquake. So this is how you would calculate U2. Now, when I was an undergrad and I was given this exact lecture, I'm thinking, I have no idea what I'm doing. I was given all the theory, I was given all the equations, but I had no idea how to apply that. So what I want to do is I just want to go over a quick little procedure on how exactly we would go about finding those U2 factors and at the end of the day, our design loads. So let's look at the following frame right here. Before we begin, I'm going to talk about the first trick that students fall for, and that is this. When we're dealing with these frame analysis, we have to make sure that all the applied loads on our frame are factored. Okay, so if I'm looking at this and I have a distributed load W and a lateral load H, I have to make sure that both of them are factored. If they're not factored, I need to stop what I'm doing, factor them, and then continue on. The next thing that I have to do is I have to start distinguishing which bays are moment resisting and which are not. As we remember in the U2 calculations, we have that parameter that talks about the axial load for our moment resisting frame columns. So if I were to look here, we can see that bay ABCD is a moment resisting frame. It has no hinges on the beam above it. However, if we were to look at the second bay, since the beam up top is hinged, we know that this bay right here would actually not be a moment resisting frame. So this would mean that column AB and CD are moment resisting frame columns. However, column EF, this is what we would just call a leaning column. It would not be accounted for in the moment resisting frame calculations. It should be noted, however, that this column will experience second order effects. So please don't think that it won't. Every column in our structure will experience these second order effects. The key thing to keep in mind is that when we're doing our moment resisting frame calculations, we wouldn't include the load taken in column EF. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So as you know, the process is actually broken down into three things. 
The first one is we do an analysis of gravity loads. Second, we do analysis of translational loads. And then third, we calculate U2 and apply it to our moments to find the final design moment. So if I were to look at the first analysis under gravity loads, the first thing that we have to do is actually restrict our frame from any sort of sway effects. What will happen is, is if the frame is not symmetric in any way, shape or form, under even gravity loads, the frame will start to translate left to right. So what we do to counteract this is we actually place a roller on our frame. And this roller will prevent our frame from again doing any sort of lateral translation. Once we restrict that lateral translation, we then analyze the frame under solely gravity loads. So if we were to look at the top here, our gravity loads would be that WF. But again, note, I'm only analyzing this frame under gravity loads. Therefore, I am not going to apply that HF or that lateral load. From here, this will give us two things. The first one is we'll have the bending moment profile as well as the axial load profile. From here, these will actually be used in the calculation of our design moments. Remember, there's three factors. We need the moments due to gravity, we need the moments due to translation, and we need U2. Well, at this stage right here, we'll have that first one, which is our moments due to gravity. However, a second thing that we always have to keep in mind is that when we look at our frame under this analysis, we added a roller. And this roller is going to create a reaction force. So one thing that happens when you do this analysis is you have to write down the value of that reaction force because we are then going to use it in our second analysis. Now, a little tip or trick, if you will, for exams, if you have a symmetric frame in terms of loading, geometry, and stiffness, those reaction forces are actually going to be equal to zero. So again, if you see a symmetric frame, you know that that reaction force is going to be equal to zero, which is great because it saves some time. But once you have the moment, axial load, and reaction force, you can move on to the second analysis, which involves translational loads. So again, I have my frame right here, and I need to now apply translational loads, which leads to the second thing that most students always forget to do, is calculate what is going to be the total lateral load I place on the frame. Well, it turns out that this total lateral load is going to be the summation of three things. The actual lateral load, HF, the notional load, as well as that reaction force from our gravity load analysis. Again, most students always seem to forget to add that reaction force RF from that first analysis. It's very important that we include it here. So basically, we get the following nice equation, where our total lateral load at story I is going to be the applied load H plus the notional load plus the reaction force. And once we know it, we can then analyze the frame under solely that calculated total lateral load. So if we look at the frame here, I would apply L1, which is my total lateral load for story one. Again, in this analysis, I'm only looking at translational loads, so I'm not actually including that factored gravity load WF. It's purely going to be lateral loads in this scenario. Now, once I do the analysis, I'm going to get, again, two things. The first one is going to be my moment and axial load profiles under this translational load, so we're looking pretty good. But the second thing that I want to look for is going to be this delta F or this relative story deflection. Remember, this is going to come into play when I'm calculating my U2 factor. Right in that PSE equation, we have this delta F factor. Now you're saying, all right, Clayton, what is this factor? Well, once we apply the loads, we can find a deflection profile, and this delta F it's going to be the deflection of the columns. Now, here's another little fun thing that's going to happen, is that if you are analyzing the frame under solely flexural deformation, all three of those delta Fs is going to be the exact same. However, if you're like me and using a software such as S-Frame, you will find that all three of those deltas are going to be a little bit different. In that case, you always want to take the maximum one. Again, you want to be conservative. However, I just want to mention that the reason why they're going to be different is because software such as S-Frame, SAP, it'll include what we call axial deformation. So again, they're going to be pretty similar, but there is going to be a little bit of a difference, and that is simply due to consideration of axial deformation. At the end of this analysis, we actually have everything we need, so we can go on to determine the design, axial load, and bending moment. First thing that we do is we can calculate our shear force for every story. It's going to be the summation of the total lateral loads at that story, as well as the stories above. 
So if I were to look at this one story frame, as we can see, our factored story shear is actually just going to be equal to L1. So it's, again, very simple. Once we know that parameter as well as everything else, we can calculate PSE and then U2 for every story. One thing to keep in mind is that every story is going to have a different PSE as well as a different U2. And then once we know U2, we can find the design axial load and bending moment using our nice formulas. So again, if I were to look at moments, my design moment is going to be the moment I obtained from my gravity analysis plus an amplified moment I've obtained from my translational analysis, and the amplification amount, U2, is going to come from those nice, easy equations that we were given in CS8. So as we can see, once you know the procedure, it's not too bad, but the first couple times of actually trying the procedure, it's very confusing on where to go. For this particular lecture, I highly recommend that you look at the examples down below because I will go into detail all the steps that you need to know both for a single story frame as well as a multi-story frame. But yeah, that's it for this video. This is one of the topics I really don't like to try and teach because again, I find most students find it confusing and I don't blame them. When you first look at this, it is really confusing. So I hope I helped and if not, I am sorry for wasting your time. Yeah, that's it for this video. I want to thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you all in the next lecture video.